All right. Anybody not get an outline that would like one tonight? Emily's got a few extra there. She'll make her way to you. All right. And if you've got a Bible with you tonight, we're going to be in Exodus 27. Exodus 27. And we're going to look at the first eight verses there and continue our study on the tabernacle. And as I said last week, we are still not quite to the nitty gritty, but we are inside tonight. All right. We're going to pass that curtain we talked about last week in the uh, outer entrance. And we've entered now into the tabernacle. We're going to come to the first piece of furniture However, we're not going to look at the actual piece of furniture per se. We're going to look at just a little portion of it, uh, the horns of the altar. And uh, so let's look at Exodus 27. Uh, before we do, I want to show you this. Uh, Nolan shared this with me, and uh, I found it intriguing, so I wanted to put it up here for you. But we had talked about a week or so ago how when they designed the tabernacle, all the tribes were um, stationed. They each had a spot where they would go, and they would surround the tabernacle. So it was a center focus, and everybody could see it at all times. As you go back to Numbers chapter 2, you start seeing some of the numbering of those tribes and in how they were set up to be in each one of the camps. And you can kind of see you've got uh, down at the bottom of that screen, you've got a couple of the, the groups that were together that numbered in the 150s, uh, thousands. And then you had a higher one up there with Judah, uh, and then Ephraim was the smallest one. And uh, as they were grouped together in those numbers and formed in their positions around the tabernacle, I, ju I just thought this was amazing when, when, when Nolan showed me this, uh, where they were positioned with their numbers. I want you to see what it looked like. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> How cool is that? Uh, you got the small number at the top, the big number at the bottom, about the equal numbers on the sides. And what does it remind us of today? Just go to Numbers chapter 2. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. You can write down. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> You know what I can do, Heidi, too, is I can print that slide for you. Just give me a copy of it. Actually, I have one in my office right now. Just remind me to give it to you. Just remind me to give it to you because you know I'll forget, you know, in the next five minutes. So just remind me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> See? You know. So anyways, but I just thought, I thought that was kind of neat the way that all, because, again, we've been talking this whole time about how everything is pointing toward the future. And, uh, of course, he hadn't died on the cross yet, but it's, uh, it's a kind of a symbolism and a pointing towards that, and I thought that was kind of neat. So thought I'd share that with you. So anyways, look at uh, Exodus 27. And again, we'll pick up verse number one and just read down through the first eight verses. Thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make it a, uh, for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net thou shalt make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt take, uh, or shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. So we've got a little bit of description of this altar. We'll come into some more of this next week when we actually get to the altar. Uh, but we see an introduction kind of to the altar and a few things. So um, your outline is really terrible today, uh, but uh, this, is the, this is the introduction. It's, it's the majority of your page, okay? So just give you some, some details here leading up to this. The brazen altar uh, was, of course, uh, we see here in Scripture, made of this acacia wood or shittim wood, uh, referring to the same thing. Uh, it was made uh, square, uh, and it was covered in brass. Now, we talked about the significance of brass several times already, and we'll, I'm sure, hit it again before the, the study is out. Uh, but we talked about that. God is very particular with his altar. Um, every detail of the tabernacle he's particular with. But you see some of the descriptions given just in those eight verses of just this one little piece of furniture and how, how significant each thing was. Uh, God told Moses in, in verse number eight, as it was shown them in the, in the mount, so shall they make it. 
He tells, he tells Moses, you know, I told you exactly how it was going to be done. That's exactly how we're going to do it. We're not making any adjustments or any changes. You're not going to freehand it. You're going to do exactly what, what's been shown to you. The brazen altar was the most used piece of furniture in the tabernacle. Uh, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies just once a year. And that's, of course, where the, the Ark of the Covenant was, and the blood was placed in the Holy of Holies there. Uh, but that was done once a year. Uh, other priests would go in and out of the holy place morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. But the brazen altar is where other people would come throughout each day to offer sacrifices. Now, they wouldn't offer sacrifice themselves. Obviously, there's a priest there to do that. But daily people, regular common Israelites, okay, uh, they would come into this place. So this was something that everybody was familiar with. Everybody saw. Uh, it was the first thing that you would see as you entered the tabernacle as well. The, uh, the penalty of sin, unfortunately, is, is breathtaking, is it not? Uh, the penalty of sin is death. The, uh, uh, the way to avoid that penalty is also breathtaking. The shedding of blood. The shedding of blood. The sacrifice of blood has always been God's way of atonement for sin. Now, we understand during this particular time with the tabernacle, Christ had not died on the cross and rose again. Okay, so this is all, this is all uh, future. It's pointing to it. But the blood sacrifice was still required. And the faith in that blood and what Christ would do with that blood was still required. So it's the same thing, just in a little bit of a different format. Uh, they weren't doing works or the sacrifice itself wasn't the salvation. It was still faith. In the shed blood, okay? And so that was done even in their day. Um, the Hebrew word for this brazen altar is, you ready for this? Now, it's not going to look like I'm saying this right, but, but I am. I, I, I practiced this one, okay? I worked on this one. It's Mizbaya. That's what that says. Did you know that? Mizbaya. <laughs> now, that's not what it looks like, but that's what it says. Uh, that word Mizbaya is translated altar. The word altar is translated slaughter place. This was not a place where you would come and put, you know, your uh, pack of Oreo cookies on and say, here's my sacrifice, okay? This was a bloody, bloody place. Uh, it was a blood sacrifice that would be offered upon this altar uh, for, for sins of people. So literally millions of animals were slaughtered on this particular place. Their blood uh, was on the brazen altar. When a person walked into the tabernacle, uh, this was the very first thing he would see. The very first thing he'd see as he would, as he would enter the tabernacle was this altar of uh, burnt offering or this brazen altar. And again, we're going to specifically here in just a minute focus on the horns, but um, that's the first piece of furniture he'd see. This means it was the focus of attention for all who entered. You could not avoid it. You could not say, well, I just won't see that. When you walk in, it's there, okay? Everybody who came past that outer curtain and entered into that courtyard there would see the brazen altar. What's that a reminder? It's a reminder that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? <laughs> we, we all need to look through, through the cross. We all need salvation. We all need to have the blood applied. And so every Jew, as they would travel here day by day and set this thing up, every time they'd enter, that was the first thing they would see. That was the center of their attention in this particular part of the uh, tabernacle there. Um, I can't imagine how, I don't, I don't know if breathtaking is the word or not, but uh, how amazing it would have been to see this piece of furniture when you walk in it's got a blazing hot fire in it you see priests surrounding it who are constantly tending to sacrifices because people are constantly involved in sin right this was not a well we use this once a week or so this was used all the time why because we sin a whole lot don't we <laughs> we may not want to admit it but but it's true and so can you imagine just walking and seeing that scenery uh, the smoke billowing the fire uh, blazing the blood everywhere the sacrifices uh, the priests there that are offering the sacrifices and i'm sure they had a rotating basis that they would go in and out of the tools that they were used were described there in chapter 27 what a scene this must have been every time you walked into the tabernacle you, very seldom i imagine did you ever walk in and somebody wasn't there and a sacrifice being offered I would yeah, yeah, right? It's a good thing it was open air, right? <laughs> it's a good thing the courtyard didn't have a covering over the top. So, but yeah, think about it. I mean, this this is a scene that some some would dis be disgusted with, and some would say, "Hey, I'm thankful for that because without that, I'm I'm in trouble." And so it's kind of got a mixed emotion to it if you really think about it. 
the altar itself, and we see this in scripture here, uh, it was made of acacia wood. It was square. Uh, it was seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, four and a half feet high. Do we have anybody here that's four and a half feet high? Margie, are you four and a half feet high? You're taller than that? Are you sure? How tall are you? You're five one. Is anybody shorter than five one? Five and one half. Boy, you guys are gonna fight it out. Sure, sure you're kind of in the middle. Stay, could you, would you stand up for just a second? Now I want you to think. Okay, now <laughs> this is gonna sound mean. Take off her head. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take off her head, and that's how tall the altar was. This is not some little rinky, oh, you sit down, thank you. This is not some little rinky-dink little, you know, thing. It, it's as tall as her and, and as wide as that row there that's sitting there and as long as that row sitting there. I have no idea. Let me go get a tape measure. I'm just kidding, I don't know, no, I don't know. It, it's probably about right, yeah, it's probably about right, yeah. So, so you see, this is, this is, this is big. It's hard to miss, <laughs> not alone with it constantly being used, you know, hard to miss. So uh, that kind of gives you kind of the, at least, a, a, I think I got a little picture up here for you too. Uh, that's kind of just a little, I guess this is an artist rendering of it, but uh, uh, you can kind of see how it's a, it's a perfect square. It's got the grates built into it on the sides and the top. And I got another picture I'll show you here in just a minute that kind of gives you a little bit more detail. You see the horns on the top and the corners. You see the rings that were talked about, the staves that would go through the rings. Um, those staves did not stay in there when it was actually in the tabernacle. Those were used to transport it. As they would move that tabernacle from place to place, uh, that's how that piece of furniture would be moved. So, um, I, you know, I thought about this, this altar, and I thought about the purpose of this altar uh, and, and the blood sacrifices that were required so often. I couldn't help but think, the world sure does offer some cheap alternatives to becoming right with God and finding salvation and having a home in heaven, don't they? You know, the world will teach, you know, you can be accepted by God if you just do the best that you can. You know, just try hard. And, you know, if your good outweighs your bad, he's got to accept you. The problem is this, it won't. My, my good's not going to outweigh my bad. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Uh, if you belong to a certain church or if you're a part of a certain religion, you're good. You're golden. You're, you're fine. You're there. Yeah, he, he, you're accepted by him. But if you're not part of our religion, you're in trouble. <laughs> I'm glad, that, I'm glad that acceptance with God is not based on religion. <laughs> I'm glad it's based on, on the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, some, some would teach, you know, you become right with God if you learn to worship and accept other gods. Uh, that, that is taught. Uh, follow a man. We see that in a lot of our cults today. Not the Indianapolis cults. The cults with the U, okay? Uh, they, <laughs> you see them following a man. <laughs> Well, so-and-so, you know, 400 years ago said, and this is what God revealed to him, let's follow. And what happens? They're being led astray and deceived in the way to get to God, in the way to find salvation. Uh, those are cheap alternatives. We see the answer. <laughs> way back in the tabernacle, it's the shedding of blood. It's that sacrificial uh, lamb that was often shed. The brazen altar tells us quite differently from what the world says. The brazen altar teaches us there must be atonement and reconciliation with God. There must be atonement and reconciliation for, uh, with God. The forgiveness of sin in order to approach God, enter his presence, in order to become acceptable with God, we have to understand that man needs a savior. Uh, we need a, a mediator, if you will, not a man, but the man Christ Jesus. A savior who will sacrifice himself for us. Uh, isn't it good to know that Jesus Christ is, was, and always will be the Son of God, always be our Savior. You know, as we think about the horns of the altar, um, just, a, just a quick thought, I thought, why, why look at the horns? What do they signify? What do they mean? Why is it important? I want to give you three thoughts here in just a minute on why those horns are, are specifically important and what they represent for us today. Uh, the altar also had what was referred to in Scripture as the compass. The compass of the altar was a shelf, a ledge, if you will, halfway between the top and the base uh, of the altar. It probably had a twofold purpose. Uh, it would catch any part of the sacrifice that might have fallen off the main part and fallen down. Uh, and so it also that way the, the priest could get it back up on the top because he worked on the top of that, uh, that altar there. Uh, and probably secondly, it would hold those utensils that were mentioned in verse number three. 
Uh, he talks about all these flesh hooks and shovels and vessels and fire pans and all the things that we use. That shelf would also be used to hold those types of things. So there's a reason for everything. And, and God designed his, he, he's better than the best carpenter today, okay? He knew this, and, and so that's how he planned that. Each corner of the, of the uh, bronze gate, or you kind of saw that, that picture we sh- showed earlier with the, uh, uh, the uh, grates kind of on the side. You saw just above that were those rings. Uh, it was a bronze ring at the corner of each of those, and of course that was for carrying the, the, that altar. Two staves were passed through those rings for carrying. Those were also uh, hollow, they were wood, and of course covered, overlaid in brass as well, and they would carry the altar. Uh, the third thing there, oh, there, there's a little picture of it, and we'll talk about the horns here in just a second. Kind of give you a little kind of, kind of see the top there. Uh, that basket, if you want to call it that, off to the side, would then sit inside, and that gives you that idea of where that shelf is, where that compass is. Uh, and so anything that would overflow would fall on that. Uh, there must have been some sort of opening where they could put those tools. But it's just, again, it's an artist thing. I wasn't alive. I couldn't, you know, really draw it for you. Roger maybe could remember, uh, but I'm not sure. But, uh, uh, but it just kind of gives you a little idea. And, of course, you can once see, uh, even in this, you see those four horns sticking out of the altar, okay? We're not talking about... You see these guys with their you know, big old Cadillacs with the big old bull horns? We're not talking about that kind of horn, okay? I know you think about it. What are you talking about horn? Just, just little brass <laughs> things that look like a horn were on each part of the, each corner of this altar. And it has a very specific purpose. Um, they were made of, of, of one, one piece, each horn. It wasn't separate. You know, it wasn't like put together or joined together. It was one piece forming the horn. It was attached there to the corners. Uh, and so the horn of Scripture, the horn of the, uh, of the brazen altar here, it symbolized something for us to look at. It symbolized something then. It symbolizes something today. So let me give you the three things here that this horns uh, uh, talk about. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Grab a hold of the horns uh, of the mercy seat of God. You know, get a hold of the horns uh, in your prayer closet, the horns of the, of the altar, and get a hold of God. There's significance for that. There's reasons why people say that. Uh, and so tonight as we look at the horns of this altar, I'm going to give you three things that these, these horns symbolize, what they stand for, what they represent. The first one, strength. Strength. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 10, it says, Lord, give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Exalt the horn of his anointed. Um, strength. You see something that is... Uh, you ever? <laughs> You ever tried to knock something off of something that has been welded together? You know, you got a piece welded to some metal, and you try, good luck, it ain't going to happen. That's kind of the same thing here. This, these, these horns were, were part of the altar. It wasn't like an attachment. It wasn't like something added after an aftermarket piece, okay? This was built in. It was custom made that way. Good luck getting them off, all right? This was, this was representing strength, okay? Uh, and I put down a couple of thoughts. I said, first of all, the horns speak of victory, that Jesus experienced on the cross. Victory that Jesus experienced on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 15 says this, And having spoiled principalities and power, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Think about the victory and the power that was displayed on the cross. Again, if everything we have in the tabernacle is pointing us to Christ today, then we can take into account the fact his death on the cross, the victory that he showed, the power that he shows, was, was, a, was a symbol of his strength. You know, I, I don't think we understand fully, I don't think we ever will, even when we get to heaven, I don't think we will, what Jesus endured. Not just on the cross, before the cross, during the cross, after the cross. I mean, you think about all that he endured and suffered. That was, that was a strong person. These people that paint Jesus, you know, up and they get him this little, you know, little trickle of blood running down here. And this little, you know, he looks like a little sissified glass figurine. Are you kidding me? He was a man's man. He, 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 was, he, was, he was tough <laughs> to think of what, what he put up with and what he endured. A sign of strength. And these horns on the altar, it's just reminding us, hey, in the presence of God, there's strength. In the presence of God, there's power. In the presence of God, there's all kinds of possibilities. Because it's not about us. It's about Him. Uh, The horns speak of victory upon the cross. Secondly, they speak of the mighty power of God. The mighty power of God. Psalm 89, 17 says, Thou art the glory of their strength. 
and in thy favor uh, our, our horn shall be exalted. First Samuel, I'm going I'm to turn to a couple passages here. I don't have them on the screen here for you, but First Samuel chapter 2. They're probably on your paper there, uh, so if you want to look at them later, you can. But First Samuel chapter 2, I should have had these marked because my fingers don't work right now. We'll get there. If you beat me to it, you can read it. Verse number 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. We see it again. The power of God. You realize what happens when you enter into the throne room of God, if you will, when you enter into the prayer, prayer closet. You know, we talk about grabbing the horns of the altar in prayer. You don't, you don't realize that means? That means we've entered into the very presence of God. And what we're coming to with our requests and our burdens and our needs or our praises or whatever it may be, we're bringing those before somebody who can do something about them. We're putting them in the hands of a sovereign God who's all-powerful, okay? And so, so, again, even in our prayer life, when you think about the horns of the altar here, it, it's not about how flowery my speech is. It's not about whether I can remember a name or forget a name or mispronounce a name. It's not about, you know, well, he's so, he, has, he is such an orator. It's a matter of this. I'm simply pouring my heart out to the king of kings. And then I leave it up to the mighty power of God. Aren't you thankful for the power of God? <laughs> Uh, we've had a lot of, lot of praises tonight, and God, God works, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, make sure we praise Him when He does, amen? Uh, but the horns, first of all, represent strength. Not mine, not yours, not religions. They re represent the strength of Christ on the cross and the power of an almighty God uh, who spoke the world into existence and who sustains it today. Uh, the horns speak of strength, number one. Number two, number two, the horns speak of salvation. Salvation. Got a lot of lot of verses up there for you. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, I'll tell you what. Somebody help me out. Somebody go to Psalm 118, 27. We're going to let you participate tonight. I hope you're ready. Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 118, 27. Somebody find it? 118, 27. If you found it, say, I found it. I'll give you a piece of candy. Oh, Heidi got it. Can you read that out loud, Psalm 118, 27? Read it with your best radio announcer voice. <laughs> she. <laughs> God is the Lord. I don't see how you like it. I will sacrifice the soul. He that strengthens the loins of the Lord. Okay. God is the light. And it talks about binding the sacrifice to the horns of the altar. Luke 1, verse 69 says this. And it raised up a horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David. All right. What bloodline does, that, does Jesus come from? In the house of David. It, Jesus is that horn that's referred to. By, by the way, you read Revelation and, and Jesus is referred to as a horn there as well several times. And of course, there's other mentions of horns there too. But, but uh, we, we refer to that as Jesus many times. Um, somebody, uh, Exodus chapter 30. I'm going to let you, let you help me because I'm. Uh... Somebody found it. Terry, can you read verse number 10? Okay, now that's, that's referring to the horns on the Ark of the Covenant. And it's that once a year thing, but it's still referring to the horns and how important those horns are or the blood is applied to the horns for the atonement of sin. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse number 15 says this, And he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. So we see, and there's other passages as well, I'm just going to point those ones out there. But we see the importance of the altar, but we see the importance of the horns of the altar. The blood was applied to those horns for a reason. Uh, you see sanctification in there, you see reconciliation in there, we read that in Leviticus. Uh, and so the, 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 the purpose of the horns, number one, we talked about was strength, but number two, they represent salvation. Now, I don't know about you, but I am glad today that we don't have to have an altar up here with uh, fires burning and we have to bring in an animal and slaughter and apply the blood and do all this stuff. I'm glad we don't do that, aren't you? <laughs> I'm glad that the, the perfect sacrifice on Calvary was made a couple thousand years ago, right? And Jesus did all that and took care of all that for us. I'm thankful for that. But, but this picture here of the horns, just the horns, not the altar itself, just the horns, 
picture salvation for, the, for you and I today. Uh, I put down a couple of thoughts here. Paul, Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. We get saved today when we believe the gospel. What's the gospel? The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see that clearly put to us in Scripture. That's what the gospel is. The death, burial, the resurrection of Christ. And we, we receive salvation uh, when, we, when we receive the power of the gospel. Likewise, in their days, uh, they got their salvation through the blood of that animal that was applied. Uh, they got their, their forgiveness of sins and the delayment of the punishment of their sins, that yearly thing with the, with the uh, Ark of the Covenant and the priest, high priest would go in and offer that sacrifice once a year. That's how their sins were taken care of. It's a little bit different now for us today. I get that, but Christ has come now, and he's died, and he's risen again. And so we got to understand the power involved with salvation. Uh, the, the power involved with salvation. He, he died, he rose again. <laughs> That's pretty powerful right there. And then he draws us unto him. And the Holy Spirit uh, leads us and, and impresses us towards him. And we see God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit all working together. Why? To, to provide salvation for you and for me. Uh, so, so we're thankful for that. Uh, secondly, the horn symbolized the fact that God accepted the sacrifice as a substitute for the believer himself making the offering. Okay? When, when Christ died on the cross, what did that mean for you and for me? He was my substitute. That means I don't have to die on the cross to pay for my own sins. He did it for me. The same thing's true here when you think about the horns of the, of, the, of the altar here. And that sacrifice was made and that blood was put on the horns of the altar. Uh, the, the, it was a symbolization or the, the, the payment was made. It was a substitute. What, what he's saying is, you know, you, you, we should be putting you on the altar and putting your blood on the horns <laughs> to pay for your sins. Which is what we deserve as well, right? We deserve to pay for our own sins, but Jesus did it for us. And so even back in those days, again, a little different, I understand that. But that's what those horns are symbolizing, that God accepted that sacrifice. I accept this sacrifice as a substitute. Instead of you dying, we'll allow the animal to die, and that blood will be applied to the horns of the altar. Uh, third thing we put down was this. When Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross, Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that God was satisfied with the offering. God was satisfied with the offering. You realize under Jewish, Jewish law and, and back in these days, Every year, uh, of course, uh, daily and, and hourly, uh, people were coming and offering sacrifices for their individual sins you know, on this, gold, this brazen altar here. But every, every year, once a year, that, that special event would take place in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest would go in, right? That spotless lamb would be, would be slaughtered. The blood would be put on the mercy seat. The scapegoat would be sent out. And, and the, the postponement of the judgment of Israel's sins would take place for one more year. But it had to happen every year. Every year. You know, when Jesus died for our sins, you know what God said? It's done. I'm satisfied. A hundred percent. No more sacrifices. Uh, no more death. No more blood needs shed. Nothing needs to be added to or taken away from. It's complete. It's complete. And again, that veil being ripped in half symbolizes the fact that now we have access to God. It's, it's done. It's finished. It's complete. And so just like the horns and the blood being there, God said, I, I, that's acceptable. You don't have to die on that altar now. I'll, I'll take the blood of that sacrifice. When Christ died for us, same thing. Uh, he became our substitute. And God was satisfied with that. Not yearly, not weekly or monthly or, or you know, every couple hundred years. Once for all. He made that sacrifice, that payment. So, so the horns, they represent a couple things. Strength, number one. Salvation, number two. And then number three, security. Security. Somebody find Psalm 18, verse number two, please. Psalm 18, verse number two. Now, if I was giving away candy, you guys would be like fighting to get there first. Sword drills, right? Put your Bible up. And uh, <laughs> first one to find, okay, Mark, you got Psalm 18.2? 18.2. Eight, wow. Did you hear all those descriptive words? Buckler, high tower, deliverer. 
What are the other ones? Height, or, you got it there too? Rock, fortress, shield, strength, <laughs> the horn of my, what did we just talk about? Salvation, okay? All those wonderful words. And speaking, of course, of Christ, and that's, that's who he is to us. I don't know about you. I, I feel pretty secure with that person guarding me, wouldn't you? I feel pretty secure. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 3 says this. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. My high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Two totally different authors. Two totally different time periods. Same message. Same message. Uh, Our horn of salvation is also our place of security. I'm saved today not because of anything I did. Not because of anything I continue to do. Not because of anything I avoid or anything that I obey. I'm saved today and remain saved today because of the saving, keeping power of Jesus Christ. Uh, He took care of that. He's my security. He's my strength, my sword, my tower. Uh, If you look at a couple thoughts here, I put down under this here and we'll finish this up. The sacrifice, uh, we read the verse earlier. I think think maybe Heidi read it in Psalm 118. Uh, The sacrifice was bound to the horns of the altar. Now, it wasn't the complete uh, thing, but they start by, by uh, uh, strapping that animal, whatever it may be, whatever size it would have, would have been, and they would tie that to the, to the horns of that altar. They would strap it there. They would bind it there. They would sacrifice it there. Blood then would be put on those altars as, or on those horns as well, uh, and that sacrifice then would be considered uh, complete as a substitute for that person's sin. Uh, so we read Psalm 118 earlier. The sacrifice was bound. Secondly, the blood was smeared on the horns. The blood was smeared on the horns. Exodus chapter 29, I'm right there, so I'll read it real quick. Exodus chapter 29 and verse number uh, 12 says this. And thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. We read earlier in a passage of scripture, David did that with the sacrifice, remember? He put the blood on the horns of his finger and he poured the rest of the blood down to the sides of the altar. For sanctification and for reconciliation. We saw that. Uh, So the blood was to be smeared on the horns. Now you say, why is that significant? Why is that significant? Uh, And I'll just say this because once again, Christ did not die on the cross with a little trickle of blood running down his forehead. Okay? You talk about blood smeared everywhere. That was our Savior. The Bible says his visage, you could hardly even tell he was a human how badly he'd been beaten. Uh, you know, the, the, the wounds. I, you know, I, always, I often think about after that cat of nine tail experience that he had, the weakness, first of all, that he must have experienced with all that loss of blood and uh, inward parts being able to be seen. I'm, not, I'm not trying to discuss you tonight. That's what scripture says. And, and you could see some of the inward parts of him. And then they put that robe on him to mock him. But then before he was crucified, they had to rip that robe off. And once again, open all those wounds up again. And the crown of thorns busting the capillaries in the, in the forehead of that man. And, and blood just pouring everywhere. This looked like more of a savage beast than anything. The blood was smeared. They weren't careful with it during, during, during Old Testament days. You know, the priest didn't say, well, let me get a little bit here and a little bit here. And oh, I don't want to get too much in my hand. I got a feeling it was, hey... This is a serious thing, and this is the substitute for sin. We're going to take it seriously. And I imagine the blood was dipped in the hands on the fingers and, and smeared all around. I imagine it was dripping and it was flowing. Representing, of course, what Christ would do for us so many years later. Uh, third, let us see there. To have laid hold of the horns was also a claim to the right of sanctuary. The right of sanctuary. Exodus chapter number 21 and verse number 14, you got it? Man, you're fast. <laughs> Exodus 21, look at verse 14. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with, with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Let me, let me explain real quick. There are two instances in, in, in Scripture, at least I'm just going to give you tonight, and I'll put them both up there. Um, Adonijah. In 1 Kings chapter 1, feared that King Solomon was going to kill him. And Adonijah came to the tabernacle, and he grabbed hold of the horns of this altar. And he said, sanctuary, I'm safe here. 
You can't get me here. It was designed as a place also, not just of sacrifice, which we see in so much tonight. It was also a place of retribution, or a place to protect somebody from retribution for an accidental death. Now, you remember later on in Scripture, uh, they set up uh, cities of refuge. You all, you all know that term? You're familiar with that? And they set up these cities of refuge where if you were to accidentally uh, you know, kill somebody, uh, you know, not intentional, it wasn't done in spite or anger, it just happened. Well, obviously, that person's family, their, their first thought is, well, we're going to kill you. And so you were allowed to go to a city of refuge and plead your cause, and you were allowed to stay there and have protection. This, this altar, if you were to come into the temple, the sanctuary, and grab a hold of the arms of that altar, uh, you could have protection from something like that. We also see it in 1 Kings chapter 2 with Joab. Uh, Joab did something he should not have done. <laughs> he killed somebody he should not have killed. And David found out about it and said, you know what? Joab's going to pay for that. And if you read the account in 1 Kings chapter 2, you'll see all this. And uh, David sends his man and says, go find Joab. And the man comes back and says, he's hanging on to the horns of the altar. He's pleading sanctuary. And David says, I don't care what he's pleading. He did it on purpose. He's going to die. And they, they actually took him out of the sanctuary, like Exodus chapter 21 we just read a minute ago. Uh, if you've uh, done that uh, presumptuously and slayed him with guile, Take him out that he may die. And it happened to Joab. So it was a place where the, you know, the, 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 the forgiveness of sins, that substitute was taking place with the blood being smeared. But it was also a place where somebody could come for safe, safety or protection or sanctuary. Last thing I'll give you this tonight, letter D. Since Christ is the horn of our salvation, we saw that mentioned several times in passages that we read. It gives every believer that thought of eternal security. If he gave it, he's got to take it. And according to my Bible, he says, I'm not going to take it. Because you're in my hand, and my hand's in the Father's hand, and no man can pluck you out. He wants to keep us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, talks about how we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of promise. That day of promise is our great hope. When he's going to return and call us home to be with him in heaven someday. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit seals us unto that day. Uh, Christ, being the horn of our salvation, says this. I'm eternally set. I'm saying, I don't have to find another Christ. I don't have to find another method of salvation. I don't have to, every time I, get, get, every time I commit a sin, go and get re-saved, okay? Uh, he did it. And, and if I truly got saved the first time, all my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And I'm thankful for that, amen? Especially the future ones, because I know they're coming, right? I'm thankful for that. But I'm secure in Christ. And we talked about that, that uh, uh, um, Margie, Margie read that verse about him being our, our, our buckler and our shield and our rock and our fortress. That's pretty secure. He's our security. And the horns of that altar, way back in Bible days, as they're building this tabernacle and traveling with it, show us some things today that say, hey, look at this. Look what it meant for them, but look what it means for you today. Some of it's the same, and some of it's a little better, <laughs> even than what they experienced. But we can see even on just those four little horns, on one piece of furniture, the significance of in the application it has to the child of God today. I'm thankful that uh, Christ is our salvation. I'm thankful he's our strength. And I'm thankful he's our security. Amen. <laughs> and next time you think about the altar and the horns of the altar. Remember who the horn of your salvation is. It's Jesus Christ. And I can trust him in all things. And I'm thankful that we can. Next week we're going to study the actual altar. Okay now we're in. We've come through the gate. We've come through the curtain. Okay. We're at the altar. We've seen the horns and what they represent. Next week, we will break down the actual altar itself and uh, describe it a little bit more and then see what each one of those things represents uh, when we study the brazen altar. Right? Exodus 38, that's where we'll be. So uh, if you want to read that little passage or more ahead, you can do so. Uh, but that's where we'll be for next Wednesday evening. Okay? We got our blanks filled in? Yes? Questions, comments, thoughts? Can you imagine the line? I mean, seriously. Can you imagine waiting, waiting in line? Because there weren't a lot of people not sinning. <laughs> I guarantee you there were more sinning than not. You had the time. You had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, that's when I'm going to go and get my forgiveness. But, yeah, think about it. It was constantly flowing, constantly flowing. Absolutely. Amen. Some priests were worn out, I am sure. All right. Yes, ma'am.
Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Sign your name. Sign how many t- boxes you take. Bring them back filled with goodies for the kids. It's got the stuff you need in there, right? Right. And bring them back filled with goodies for the kids in an envelope with a hundred dollars for shipping. I'm just kidding. They do. She'll, she'll mention this later. It'll be on the table too. But they do ask you to give a nine dollar donation for shipping. If you can't, you can't. And uh, we understand that. But if you can, it helps us out too. So what's that? It's gone up to ten. Inflation. <laughs> okay. If you can only do nine, we'll pitch in the other buck. But the church church takes care of it if it's not met. But um, you know, if you can help with that, that's a blessing as well. So either one, either one. It's, it's just make sure it's marked what it's for, so it goes to the right right spot. Shoebox. You can put shoebox. You can put. You know, kids, Christmas, what, whatever. We'll, we'll make sure it gets there. So, yep. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm supposed to remind a couple people that are supposed to be practicing for a song. Norma. I think Norma. Is it Norma? Norma and Alicia? And Larry. <laughs> I was waiting for him to say, what? You want me to sing? Yes, ma'am. You got another one? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Sherry, if you make a check, just do it to the church because then we do it all one lump sum to them. So, yeah. yeah. And you'll hear more information. There'll be some stuff on there, uh, do's and don'ts and all, all kinds of good stuff. Now, I think last year, th- they make a video usually, and they send that out of what took place last year. And I think either the video this year or the video last year was where our boxes went. I can't remember which, but it's where our, ours were sent. So that was, that was pretty neat to see it was from, from that location. So, But uh, it's a blessing to it'll be a blessing to them. So. Uh, men, don't forget, we do have uh, breakfast Saturday, 8 o'clock, so remember that. Bring a friend, you're more than welcome to. Bring a good dish to share, and we'll have a good time. All right. Did you have some? Oh, yeah, candy, we're taking, we're, this from September to December is like the, the, the quarter of give, 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 give. We need help, 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 help. Uh, but it's okay because it's, it, all goes, <laughs> it all goes out there. But yeah, if you can help with candy donations for our uh, um, uh, candy connection that we'll do here in October, uh, we appreciate that as well. And uh, just be a blessing. That's all we can do. God takes care of the rest. We're thankful for that. So, Amen. All right, well, let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and goodness. Thank you for the time we've had in your word and, and to pray, Lord, and just to be with your people. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we truly will never forget or lose our gratitude for the wonderful sacrifice that you made for us on Calvary the substitute, the, the payment for our sin, the blood, Lord, it's applied to our lives. And when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of his son. And we're so thankful for that tonight. And Father, we ask you now as we uh, get, get, get dismissed, Lord, we go home. Just give us safety, please, as we travel. And uh, we thank you for those that uh, you brought home from the hospital this week. And we want to praise you again for that. And we just ask you to help us to live for you the remainder of this week. Bless our activities this weekend. Uh, men's breakfast, Lord, the other things going on here on campus. And, uh, Lord, just the, the services on Sunday even. Start preparing our hearts, Lord, we pray. And we ask you to continue to work in our lives. May we live for you and, and love people through you, we pray. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out. And see you, men, on, on Saturday.